Good evening. I understand we had inauguration today. So explains a lot of our missing individuals. So it's a day to celebrate, I assume. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, we're mostly concentrated in this area, so that's fine. What's important is we have uh, a lot of live streaming going on with this particular conference. So I want to take the opportunity. Um, do you want to do the protocols first? Do they have to play that? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's, uh, let's hear the hotel protocols before we start. Welcome to the Hyatt Regency Trinidad. Your safety and well-being during your time with us is our first main priority. Therefore, it is essential and necessary that you are familiar with our emergency evacuation procedures. Should it become necessary to evacuate the hotel, a continuous siren will sound, followed by an audible instruction to evacuate the building. When you hear, may I have your attention please, over the public announcement system, you should proceed to the exit closest to you and make your way to the muster point, proceeding east along the waterfront towards the western end of the Femme du Chalet, better known as the Breakfast Shed. In the event of an earthquake, do not run out of the building. Stay calm, drop, cover, and hold on. If evacuation is required, please listen for instructions via the hotel's PA system for the earthquake evacuation route and muster point. Associates from Hyatt will assist you with evacuating. Once outside, conduct a headcount for your group to ensure that everyone is accounted for. Should you believe someone is missing, notify the Hyatt associate in your area. Do not return to the building for any reason until the fire service has stated it is safe to do so. Thank you. Be safe and have an enjoyable time with us. Okay, well, welcome all. Uh, welcome to this ninth iteration, actually, of Keeping History Above Water. Uh, this is Resilient Heritage Trinidad and Tobago. I'm Lisa Craig, president of the Craig Group Partners. Our firm is very pleased to be working with the University of Florida as well as the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago, our hosts here. Uh, Keeping History Above Water was originated by the Newport Restoration Foundation in, in 2013, and you'll hear a more formal welcome from them in just a moment. Uh, it was intended to actually be a multi multidisciplinary gathering of experts, people in the areas of historic preservation, climate science, uh, uh, engineering, architecture, those who were dealing most with this uh, concerning issue of sea level rise and in, uh, caused by climate change. This is the first time it's actually been hosted outside of the United States. Uh, we hope to continue that in the future because it's always been the goal of this conference to present global best practices for climate adaptation to protect cultural heritage resources. And this conference is no exception. Our speakers will highlight climate vulnerability and adaptation strategies from places as diverse as Thailand and Cuba, St. Martin and St. Augustine. Welcome to many of you who are joining us uh, live via Zoom. If you'd like to invite or share others, uh, the conference video, please find it uh, tomorrow, probably uploaded on YouTube. And it can also be located on the National Trust Trinidad and Tobago webpage, which is resilientheritagett.com. Uh, this was a effort of uh, the communications team at the National Trust and uh, Ryan Anderson, who's with the Market House, to make that possible. Thanks also to our audio visual team, Media 22 LTD, uh, for making this all work for nearly the 300 individuals that are actually registered for the virtual event from nearly 20 countries. Here in Port of Spain, we have along with our Trinidad and Tobago attendees, representatives from the United States, Egypt, and other West Indies nations. And we're also pleased to welcome uh, several national trust organizations here over the next three days, uh, representatives from UNESCO, from the United Nations, uh, the U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, numerous uh, Caribbean, European, and U.S. academic institutions. 
You've seen a list running of our sponsors for keeping history above water, um, beginning with our host, the National Trust, Trinidad and Tobago. I'd like to introduce to you now the woman who led the effort to secure not only the funding for this conference, but the entire Resilient Heritage Initiative, Kira Rupsing, the National Trust Senior Heritage Preservation Officer, and she will provide a formal welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is an honor to speak to you all today at the Keeping History Above Water Conference in Trinidad and Tobago. As we gather here today, we are faced with a pressing challenge, one that threatens the very foundations of our nation, climate change. This affects, the effects of this global crisis are being felt across Trinidad and Tobago, and our cultural heritage is no exception. The National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago has played a vital role in protecting and preserving the cultural and natural heritage of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is a privilege to be a part of this important project and gathering where colleagues, government agencies, NGOs, community-based organizations, private institutions, members of the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago, other national trusts, all with an interest in climate change and heritage, have chosen to attend and participate in this conference. The rising sea levels and increasing frequency of extreme weather events pose a serious threat to many of our most important cultural and historical sites. From the historic buildings and monuments of Port of Spain to the traditional villages and landmarks of our rural communities, all are vulnerable to the devastating effects of climate change. The National Trust has been at the forefront of this effort working tirelessly to protect our heritage and ensure that it remains accessible and meaningful to future generations. We are no stranger to green initiatives at the Trust, as our main site, Nelson Island Heritage Site, runs entirely off-grid with a site with a small desalination plant that provides water to the island, which is driven by solar power, a 17 kilowatt solar PV system making it the largest off-grid solar PV system in Trinidad and Tobago to date. Moreover, through initiatives like the Resilience Heritage Trinidad and Tobago Project, the National Trust is helping to understand and plan for the effects of climate change on our historic properties. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges we face are great, but so too are the opportunities. By working together, by supporting organizations like the National Trust, we can ensure that Trinidad and Tobago remains a thriving, vibrant, culturally rich, multi-ethnic and multicultural nation for generations to come. I just want to recognize a few key stakeholders of this project. Of course, the National Trust staff and team, our chairman, Margaret McDowell, um, Crystal Austin, the grant officer, and our partners in this project, University of Florida, Clary Larkin, Sujin Kim, and Marty Hilton, who actually started this process with me a couple years ago. The Craig Group, thank you to Lisa and Haley and Kimberly, and of course the US Embassy, Port of Spain staff, and the ambassador. And our funders of this project, the US Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation. This would not be possible without the funding. So I look forward to speaking and interacting with all of you during these coming days. And I'm particularly excited to introduce you to our National Trust office at Miofle, which you're going to this evening, which is one of the magnificent seven sites, and it's also a listed heritage site protected under the National Trust Act, which is one of the mandates of the National Trust. It's a true showcase of how adaptive reuse of historic building can be one of the greenest activities, because a green building is the one that's already built, as we know the construction of new buildings have a huge carbon footprint. It also adds to the character of our beloved Queen's Park Savannah Heritage District. So thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to interacting with you all this week. And now we have a video from Frank Fagnoni uh, to bring you greetings. Thank you. Hello, friends. Welcome to the first international Keeping History Above Water conference. I'm Frankie Vagnone, president of the Newport Restoration Foundation, the founders of this conference series and preservation initiative. First off, thanks to all of our partners, Lisa Craig of the Craig Group, the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago, 
the United States Embassy, Port of Spain, and the University of Florida. Thank you all again. The Newport Restoration Foundation, or NRF for short, is a preservation organization located in the United States in the town of Newport in the state of Rhode Island. Newport is the home to one of the best preserved collections of 18th and 19th century buildings in the United States and a really dedicated community of people wanting to protect these buildings. NRF itself maintains nearly 80 historic buildings, nearly half of which are located in the floodplain and within historic districts. Now, not alone to the threat of damaging floods, NRF sought innovative solutions to protect this collection and manage the effects of climate change. K Hall was founded in 2016 by NRF to foster a national conversation focused on the increasing and varied risks posed by sea level rise, in particular to historic coastal communities. These programs, conferences, and workshops focus on protecting historic buildings, landscapes, and neighborhoods from the increasing threat of flooding. Building a K-Hall network of stakeholders and policymakers has been key in sharing these resources and crafting policy change. These resources have informed the preservation work we do and we continue to champion in Newport related to sea level rise, such as the creation of graphics to accompany the city's design guidelines for elevating historic buildings. This ninth conference continues the K Hall conversation and builds this community. Now, I'm happy to say internationally. I'm thrilled to see K Hall conversation growing in this international way, and in particular, focusing on an island nation. Hoping to learn from Trinidad and Tobago's best practices and bring these conversations home to Newport. Please be on the lookout. Our conference after this conference is in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and it's coming up in May 7th through the 9th in 2023. Again, welcome, thank you all, and I look forward to learning. Just make a, a side note that to show the relationships and connections, um, I was reading Dr. Guggenheim's book, which talked about Sheldon Whitehouse in uh, Rhode Island, and I first saw him speak at the K Hall conference in Newport very passionately about the issue of climate change. So uh, we are all connected when it comes to understanding the threats and uh, the need for us to adapt. So over the next two days, and for those attending also the half day workshop on Thursday, you're gonna hear from authors, you're gonna hear from scientists, engineers, archivists, um, journalists, politicians, and policy leaders, architects, um, archeologists and cultural resource professionals all engaged in what tonight's speaker, Jeff Goodell, states as the simple truth. Every day, little by little, the water is rising, washing away beaches, eroding coastlines, pushing into homes and shops and places of worship, undoubtedly causing immense suffering and devastation. But also, as we try to do with this conference, um, bring people together and inspire creativity and camaraderie in ways that no one can foresee. The Water Will Come, Rising Sea, Sinking Cities, and the Remaking of the Civilized World is the title of Jeff Goodell's most recent published work. You'll hear more from him about his upcoming book, Addressing Our Warming World, but let me just give you a bit of, of background. I first read Mr. Goodell's work in Rolling Stone magazine, to which he is a contributing editor. The piece entitled Goodbye Miami 
how rising sea levels endanger South Florida came out in the June 2013 issue of Rolling Stone. It was just around that time that I was chief of historic preservation in the city of Annapolis, Maryland, and I was really trying to determine how our National Historic Landmark District could deal with this economic disaster we had for our historic downtown, which was nuisance flooding. The incessant slow-moving disaster was threatening small businesses and tourism in our historic downtown, and Jeff's work greatly influenced me, particularly with an emphasis on prioritizing the protection of historic places, not just because they embody a community's cultural heritage and its identity, but because they sustain the local economy and individual livelihoods. That said, as I started working, I learned in short order the challenge is immense. And we who are concerned with cultural heritage really have to make some hard decisions. Some historic places can be protected, adapted for a future of rising seas, but some can't. And so communities must choose. I appreciated that Jeff included in his book my comment to the importance of making choices when I referenced the $11 million cost of moving to Cape Hatteras Lighthouse in 1999 you can only save so many lighthouses. So I introduce you to an expert on climate change, an award-winning author and investigative journalist, a native Californian, sorry to say he's now left, but a recent Texas transplant, and the 2020 Guggenheim Fellow, Jeff Goodell. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Lisa. Um, and thank you all for coming. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you to everyone at the National Trust for um, making this talk possible, for inviting me here to talk to you tonight. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm, is this clicker? I'll, I'll go on for a moment. Um, you're re re referencing the, my first Rolling Stone article 10 years ago. It reminds me it's been 10 years now that I've been thinking about this. Um, the whole, my interest in this, I've been covering climate change for um, a decade or so. And then Hurricane uh, Sandy hit New York City. And um, I was there. Um, uh, not in the flood zone, but outside of the flood zone. And I went as a good journalist to cover the flood zone and see what happened and saw the people carrying their soggy sofas out of their houses on the Lower East Side and things like that. And a, a, um, a climate scientist I was talking to, I was thinking about how to cover this and he said, well, you think this is, uh, you know, a kind of disaster. Think about the nine feet of water that came into Lower Manhattan. Imagine if it never went out. And that's sort of what we're thinking about um, for the end of the century at the sort of high end. This was 13 years ago, 10 years ago. <clears throat> and so he said, if you really want to blow your mind about this, go to Miami. And so I said, why? And he said, just go to Miami on a sunny day flood and you'll see. And I went to Miami on a sunny day flood and there was two feet of water in um, Sunset Harbor District where you know there's million dollar condos and things. And I realized this is a big problem. This is a very big problem for our world, this idea that the land is here and the sea is there and forever it shall be. And I began exploring this idea and I wrote the story called Goodbye Miami that, that, that uh, Lisa talked about. And I always joked with my kids that um, if I ever ended up kind of in a ditch in a car accident with the brake lines cut, it was the Miami Realtor, Realtor Association <laughs> Because uh, they were not thrilled with my suggestion that uh, or the title of my piece called Goodbye Miami. But it really woke me up to the scale and complexity of what we're talking about here. And I feel it like, I can feel like the ocean behind me. It's sort of intimidating having this water right behind me right now. Um, but it's also, you know, incredibly appropriate for what we're talking about here. Um, you know, after the Miami story, I decided 
to do a book about this, and because I realized the implications had not been thought about really about rising seas. And so tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about what I learned uh, in the three or four years I spent putting this book together, a few takeaway ideas maybe for, to frame this larger conversation for you for the next few days. Um, and I want to start with one thing, which is the title of this book. Um, the title is The Water Will Come. And the, it's titled that for a good reason. It's because this question about rising seas is not speculative. It's not something that, oh, if we get our act together and we get to net zero and all the things that we hope and strive to do to cut emissions, we're going to stop sea level rise. We are not going to stop sea level rise. It's the most important idea to grasp in this whole conversation, I think. Certainly, cutting emissions is hugely important. It can change the shape of this over time, decades and centuries. But the fact is, for all intents and purposes, it is a done deal right now for all of you, for all of us, for how we think about how it's going to rebuild our world. So just, I think it's really important not to have any illusion that we can still stop this. We can't. We've already put a lot of warmth into the atmosphere, which has been sucked up into the ocean, which is melting the glaciers and is going to cause the sea level to rise. And that heat is going to stay in the oceans for a very long time. So this is going to happen. That's why the book is called The Water Will Come. It's not the water might come unless we get our shit together and we all ride electric bikes or something like that. It's very straightforward for a, a, deliberate, a deliberate way. The second thing I want to really underscore that everybody knows, but I want to underscore it, is that sea level rises has changed over time in the history of the Earth by hundreds of feet, right? Sea level rise goes up and down. The amount of water on the Earth is fixed, but some of it gets frozen when it gets cold. The water goes down. When it's hot, the water melts. When the ice melts, the water rises. This has happened over time many, many, many times. In fact, I was just hiking today up in um, Tucker Canyon, and I found what I thought was some marine fossils up there, which may or may not, you're shaking your head, someone's shaking their head maybe. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a geologist, I like to pretend to be one, and all my favorite people are geologists, but it was evidence to me, I was like, oh, okay, of course, there could be marine fossils um, in, up in Tucker Canyon, because there were times when sea level was three or 400 feet higher here. Right? And so that's a really important thing. This is not a freak thing that has never happened before. But what is happening now that is different, and I want to show this to you because this is important just in the framework of thinking about what we're talking about here, is this is the temperature of the Earth or since 1850. The blue is colder than average, red is warmer than average. It just gives you a sense of what is happening to our planet as we <clears throat> continue to burn fossil fuels and continue to heat the planet up. And this is, as, again, this is not climate modeling or anything. This is actual temperature measurements. And it's really important to put this in this kind of context because this conversation can seem really complicated, but it's also really simple. It's just like when you drop an ice cube on a hot sidewalk or something on a hot day, that ice cube melts, right? And so what's happening is we're heating things up, and as we are heating up our planet, ice is melting. And as the ice melts, that water goes into the ocean and seas rise. And that's really fundamental and really simple. The complexity comes in, how fast is this gonna happen? What it, where was it, is it going to happen, what are we, and most importantly, what are we going to do about it? But here you can see what our world is looking like now. And I, I really want you to pay, pay attention to the hot spots at the, I always get in trouble when I say top and bottom, but <laughs> for the, all intents and purposes here, the top and bottom, the ice sheets in the Arctic and the um, ice sheets in Antarctica, which I'll have more to say about in a second. But there's our world now, and you can see uh, it looks a lot different than it did in 1850. And this is the fundamental engine that is pushing what we're talking about today and was pushing many changes in our world right now. 
So the big first big question is like, okay, so how much is gonna, how fast is it coming, right? Right now, we're seeing sea level rise of just a couple of inches a decade. Maybe it's, 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 it's uh, accelerating, but it still seems to most people pretty modest. I know you here uh, on Trinidad, I know that from talking to people that it's uh, immodest here in many places. I drove out um, on the beach and saw washed away roads and washed away structures. Um, I went to, to see the, the leatherback turtles last night and was, um, when we talked a lot about the implications of washed away beaches to the turtles and how they're going to deal with the eroding beaches and what that means for their return. So this is not a theoretical thing, but the question is how fast is this going to happen, right? And so there's all kinds of scenarios and I don't wanna go through them all. This is one from South Florida. Sea level rise is not exactly the same everywhere. Um, but the important thing to look at in this, just for our conversation, for your thinking, I think, is to see that you know, the range for 2070, 50-year planning range is everything you know, uh, from a half a meter, 17, 17 inches, all the way up to almost uh, to a meter and a half, which is at the very high end. But what's really important is to see that it keeps going. None of these flatten out, right? So the question is, when you think about keeping history above water, well, which water are you keeping it above? And how do you keep it above water when that water is rising? And so when we talk about, oh, a meter of sea level rise, or half a meter, or whatever number you want to choose, you have to remember that's a fixed point, and that point is going to be changing, and that water is going to continue rising. And so you can really see here in this graph what that looks like. And here's just a, you know, it's hard to visualize all this stuff, but here's just a, um, what three feet of sea level rise looks like using NOAA's sea level rise maps in Miami Beach, which I use just because it's a sexy example and it's also a very vulnerable place. And you can see three feet of sea level rise <clears throat> and Miami Beach itself is underwater. So that's a whole lot of real estate, a whole lot of cool discos, a whole lot of good restaurants, a whole lot of great architecture that is wet, really wet. Six feet, and you can see that all of South Florida starts to go away, right? And what's really interesting is, and that is not ap so applicable here because of the structure and geography here, but in flatter places, the water comes in from both sides in Florida, not just from the sea level side, <clears throat> which adds huge amounts of complexity. I don't know if you can, can't quite see it here, but sad but true that there's a former president who has a golf course down there that will be in, in trouble. Um, uh, and here's again, just a big picture of South Florida with six feet of sea level rise, which it's beginning to look like that picture I showed you at the very beginning, right? And it's not just Florida, of course, this is just one example. I live now in Texas, the coast, the Gulf Coast of Texas, it's hard to find good, um, for, it was hard for me to find good graphics of representations of future sea level rise here, but the, the, th these, these images give you an example of um, the good news and the bad news. Unlike Florida, there's a lot of high ground here, right? And obviously there's plenty of high ground to retreat to here in Trinidad, but the problem, of course, is that there's a lot of building um, on the flat areas along the coast. In fact, my taxi driver the other night was going on and on about how they had filled in here, how some of the um, big structures in the capital district were on floating foundations. He was very well aware of it. He was talking to me about how on high tide, I'll have more to say about this in a minute, but on high tides, the flooding coming out of the mountains is more, is more difficult for it to drain, all these kinds of things. It was fascinating because he, this was just a taxi driver who was just had common knowledge and it was very accurate understanding of this. So the threat here is in the low-lying areas, right? The threat here is not that there's no land to retreat to like there is in South Florida. The threat here is that where a lot of the important development is um, is the most vulnerable areas. So let me just talk a little bit about this question of how fast this is, might happen, because this is really 
when you think about how are we going to plan for this, how are we going to keep history above water, we've got to think about how fast this might happen. And one of the things I want to point out is that we don't know how fast this is going to happen. There's lots of different climate models, lots of different ideas about this. But we do know, we scientists know, how fast it has happened before. And so one of the, one of the events that um, is often pointed to and I'm going to point to tonight um, was an event called the Younger Dryas about 14,000 years ago when we had large um, ice sheet melting that was going on. And we had a sea level rise of um, over a foot per decade. And when you think about a foot per decade of sea level rise, that is essentially going to wipe out virtually every coastal, low-lying coastal city in the world. You can't really adapt to that. Not in any meaningful way that we think of adaptation. That's the sort of Mad Max scenario of like, uh-oh, you know, we gotta get out of here kind of thing. And I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but I am saying it has happened. And one of the big questions in sea level rise science is why did that happen? What were the triggers of making, of the idea of a foot per decade of sea level rise? How did that happen? And one of the um, places where they think was part of the trigger for that was Antarctica. And Ar Antarctica is really fascinating because up until 10 years ago, more or less, when I started even writing the book, everyone thought Antarctica was fine. Big cold thing down at the bo bottom again at the southern end of, of the world. And, you know, we've, nobody lives there, of course. There's, there's science stations, but nobody lives there. We fly satellites over all the time. Nobody saw any melt. There was no, unlike in Greenland, where you see these big moulins of water melting and big ice sheets collapsing and everything. There was none of that in Antarctica. So everyone thought Antarctica's fine. We don't have to worry about it. No big deal. But then they started to understand that, oh, wait a minute. Something's going on there in a different kind of way. And the National Science Foundation and the British Antarctic Survey did this collaborative research trip down there to try to figure out what was going on, what is going on, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. But I want to say first is that I got to go on that trip. And this is the ship I was on. This is the ship that was uh, a photo that was taken by a drone we had on the ship. And if you look really closely, I'm on the top deck there waving, but you, can, <laughs> you can't really see it. But um, look at these big um, slabs of ice around here, and I, I, I'll talk to you, explain that to you in, in a minute. But, but this is our ship. This is Antarctica. And we went to this place called Thwaites Glacier, um, which is uh, often described as um, the cork in the, in the wine bottle for all of what the West Antarctic ice sheet. West Antarctic ice sheet, if it goes away, is 10 feet of sea level rise, which is a lot, right? And it's very remote, very difficult to get there. <coughs> um, and the question is, how stable is this glacier? How, what's going on with this glacier? And one of the things that scientists have come to understand, and that we went there to research, was thinking about the structure of this glacier and how it might get in trouble without melting like a popsicle or like a piece of ice. And that has to do with this. Um, the ground around, underneath that glacier, has a kind of shape, like you can see there, like a bowl. And this is what the glacier looks like when it's good and healthy. But with just small changes, and I'm talking about less than a degree or about a degree, of warming of the Southern Ocean, there starts to get warmer water under the base of these glaciers. And as we get warmer water under the base of these glaciers, the glaciers begin to melt from the bottom like this. And when they melt from the bottom, they start to destabilize. And so it's a whole different melting mechanism than you see in Greenland, and it's a one, it's a melting mechanism that, so, frankly, scientists had no clue about until very recently. And we went down there to explore this, and here's what happens. This is how you get a lot of ice into the water, into the ocean, very fast. It's like taking a big, you know, 
tray of ice and breaking it up and dumping it into, into a glass of water or something. This can happen very fast, where you have this, in, it's called marine ice cliff instability, a marine ice cliff collapse, because when they get destabilized from below, the whole thing can fall. And this gives you no sense of scale, but the Thwaites Glacier in the tall part is over a mile thick. So you can get a, a mile thick of ice, th two or 300 miles wide, into the ocean, into the Southern Ocean, very, very fast. And we went down there with this notion of, oh, is this the kind of thing that's happening? And scientists weren't really sure. And we had all these underwater vehicles and all this interesting stuff. And I won't bore you with the whole detail about it. But we found out, yes, there is instability. There is cracks in these glaciers. The water is getting underneath. And here's the freakiest thing that happened. We went down there to explore this. And this red dot on my left, I guess that's your left too, um, is where we were one day. Uh, that's our ship, and that's Thwaites Glacier. And then we um, woke up a couple days later, and there was all these giant, it had be, we had been in kind of open water, and then there are all these giant ice sheets, icebergs, all around us. And we were like, what happened? And it, it took a, a day for us to get satellite images and stuff. <clears throat> and you can see, look at the area near the, the dot on the left there versus that same area on the other picture. A part of Thwaites Glacier collapsed in exactly the way we're talking about while I was there. This is not theoretical. This happened. And this is um, me, a picture, and it's not me. That's a picture I took of one of the scientists. But we're looking at these, all of a sudden, these giant aircraft carrier size ice sheets, icebergs, were floating all around us because of the collapse of the ice shelf of Thwaites Glacier. So this was, it looked huge to us, but it was relatively small in the like bigger picture of Antarctica. But nevertheless, the evidence has shown, and the science has increasingly shown, this was three years ago that I was there, that this, is, this ice sheet collapse structure thing is happening. So no one knows how fast it's going to happen. No one knows exactly what this, the implications of this are. But it means that we've figured out another way to get a lot of water, ice into the water, really quickly. And that is something that is um, quite alarming to anybody who thinks seriously about this. The other <coughs> important thing I want to just hit on here is this, is many, everyone here knows, I'm sure, but I think it's really important to underscore, is that it isn't when you have sharks swimming through the lobby here that, that's in trouble, right? Your trouble with sea level rise have, starts to happen uh, very much before that, right? Septic systems begin to not drain correctly, and you have problems with um, polluted flood waters because you, you have septics that are not draining. You have problems with salt water getting into freshwater aquifers from the underground water pushing into saltwater aquifers. This is an issue here. I know when you have, as the seas rise, when you have a storm surge or when you have water coming down uh, out of the mountains and trying to drain, it's much more difficult for it to drain out or the storm surge is higher because the sea is higher, right? So it has huge implications for, um, for rainstorms and precipitation as well as storm surge. I know these are some pictures just of, of the um, flooding we had, you had here a few months ago. Um, and then there's the question of um, insurance, how, 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 do you, how do we manage this risk if you own a building or own a home or, you know, what, what, does, what is the financial mechanism like for thinking about this and dealing with this? Who's going to bear the risk of, is it going to be three inches of sea level rise or three feet of sea level rise in the next few decades? Who, who bears that risk and who's going to pay for it? It's a huge issue uh, in the Gulf Coast and in, and in Florida right now. And then, of course, you have people beginning to say, okay, I'm out of here. Um, and I saw that on some of the houses on the coast here, big for sale signs painted on the sides of the houses uh, as the water is crashing onto um, their front porches. Um, I saw that yesterday. And so you begin to say, okay, well, people are leaving, and where are you going to go, and what's the, the value of the real estate? And then, of course, the bigger issue is tax base, right? If people start to leave, 
the houses are worth less, tax, there's less tax money coming into the government. With less tax money coming into the government, there's less money to spend on the ad adaptations and things you need to keep buildings alive <coughs> and viable. And then you have just last week, you know, uh, Antonio Guterres, the head of the UN, was talking about um, mass exodus on a biblical scale. And, um, you know, I don't have to, I think, explain too much about what mass exodus on a biblical scale means politically in our world, right? Whether it's people fleeing in Bangladesh or there's people fleeing from small island states or people fleeing from Houston. Um, it's immigration, migration, mass exoduses of all sorts are a big political problem. And that's one of the big ramifications of, of sea level rise that we're beginning to think about. And then, of course, when we talk about, you know, infrastructure and keeping history above water, there's also keeping, like, the things we need above water that are really hard to move, like airports, right? I mean, not so much an issue, well, I don't even know about the airport here, but, um, a lot of airports are built on landfill, on right on the water because it's flat, easy, and a lot of these are hugely at risk. And elevating an airport is not a, is not a simple thing, uh, nor is moving an airport a simple thing. And that's just one example. There's many other examples of big infrastructure, nuclear plants, um, oil refineries, um, chemical refineries. Um, moving those are not simple. Here's a picture of the refineries here. And you can see that there's not a, a lot of elevation here, right? And so what happens? How do you move that stuff? What do you do? And the economic implications of that are huge. One last point before I kind of wrap this up is, this, is the idea that we're going to spend a lot of money. Everybody's going to spend a lot of money. You're going to spend a lot of money here. Um, the United States is going to spend a lot of money. Europe's going to spend a lot of money. China's going to spend a lot. Everyone's going to spend a lot of money adapting to rising seas. Um, a lot of it's going to be brilliant, and we're going to do new creative things that are going to be awe-inspiring and build a better world. And a lot of it is going to be dumb, stupid stuff that is a waste of money. And the question is, how do you know the difference, right? And so, you know, everybody knows you can elevate things. It's easy to lift up a building, you know? I mean, you can lift up anything, any building you name. It's, you talk to an engineer, it's not a problem. But the question is, OK, so do you want to live in a house that's like 10 feet above your neighbors? And what about the street? And what about you know, how do you get to your house? And what about the school? And what about you know, your commute? And do you, you know, how does it relate to your neighbors who, are, who haven't elevated their house? Or do you mandate everybody to elevate their house? And if you mandate that, who pays for that? And then there's just a lot of complexity around this idea of we're just going to elevate things. And we will elevate things, but it's not simple. Um, in Texas, we just approved $31 billion to build something called the Ike Dyke, a giant dike system, elaborate dike and gate system, modeled on one in the Netherlands, to try to keep um, storm surges and sea level rise out of Houston. And one of the reasons we're spending so much money on Houston is because it's gas and oil refineries there uh, who are helping uh, to fund this in their own way. And who, you know, you, people certainly argue with some justification that it's, in, you know, national, it's in our national interest to protect those things. Um, but they're getting a lot of, there's a lot of money now fun, being funneled into building a, essentially a big wall um, in, on the Gulf Coast in Houston. Miami spending billions of dollars elevating streets, pumping systems, all kinds of things, um, and trying to, again, buy time um, and trying to keep the structures above water. It's becoming very problematic even in the 10 years that I've been watching them. They started elevating streets. It starts changing the drainage patterns. Drainage patterns. It, it begins to shift water to other communities, and they get angry. Why, you know, is it being shifted over? Uh, the water being dumped on us, and you're okay over there. And it's very complex politically, but they're doing it. A lot of really inspired new coastal development that I really love. Um, this is just a rendering. <clears throat> 
uh, a friend in New York. Um, and you know, this idea of living with water more, coming to understand that building walls and sea walls and trying to maintain the fiction that the water is here and the land is there and forever it shall be is old world thinking. And new world thinking is to do with welcoming water in, finding ways to live with water in a kind of flexible way. People love water. I love water. That's why we're all here, right? And, and um, trying to think about how to engineer, its, engineer our relationship with water so it's not a threat, but a place that we can live with and adapt to and enjoy. This is one of my favorite um, uh, examples. This is uh, that I saw in Lagos, Nigeria, when I was reporting. Um, and it's a community center in the slums of Lagos, in the water slums. And I, I love it, and I've shown this picture many times, but I love it so much because it's such a great example of, of thinking about adaptation in a more intelligent way and building structures that are useful to people. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be a $31 billion Ike Dike. I mean, obviously, you're not going to protect um, Houston's oil refineries with you know, something made out of 50-gallon drums and extra wood. But for this community, it was a hugely important innovation. And um, it was a, it's a floating structure. It was a school. It was a community center. I'm using past tense because it blew down in a big storm eventually. But the guy who developed this, this Nigerian Dutch architect, it was just a sort of proof of concept. And they're building a, a stronger, more resilient one now. But it's just like, OK, this is like a, just a different way of thinking about about how to live and how to build, um, build community on the water. Um, these are some fancy floating houses in the Netherlands, um, in Rotterdam. Um, you know, all of us who have spent any time, and that means, of course, speaking here, it's like we're surrounded by water all the time. We love water. We want to be by water. Water makes <clears throat> all of us happy. There's something deeply instinctual about wanting to be near water. And so figuring out ways like this to do it, you know, the first time I went to Venice, it was like, oh my God, why isn't every city like this? You know, it's so wonderful, right? And so we've forgotten all that. And I think one of the things that's going to be and is being reborn rapidly is this idea of how do we live with water? And I find that to be one of the most inspiring aspects of these kinds of changes that we're going to be seeing, is that we're going to figure this out and we're going to build lots of really cool floating water-friendly structures and coastlines that aren't going to be just a big, dumb wall. And that's really cool. Big, dumb walls have their places, but so do things like this. This is an example of something else that's going on all over the world, and this is in the Maldives, which is essentially building new islands I and mean, extending islands, landfill, you know, pumping up, just using giant machinery to pump the to build land. And if you build it high enough, if you build it 25 feet high or something like that, we're going to see a lot of this, I, I know, um, because the, the economics of this work, you know, you build a lot of high land that's in a cool spot and that is relatively safe. You can sell a lot of real estate, and there's a mechanism for the economics of this. And I think we're going to see um, a whole lot of this. We, we already are seeing a lot of this. Um, but of course, that doesn't help with keeping history above water. It's, it's keeping the future above water. So to me, just to wrap this up, the big questions that have been on my mind since I wrote this book are these. First is, how fast do we get to zero emissions? That's most important, because ultimately, the long-term trends are going to be defined by how much we heat up the planet. Right? We can't stop sea level rise right now, but in the long term, it's going to matter a huge amount whether we keep burning fossil fuels willy-nilly for another decade or, I mean, another century, or we transition to net zero by 2030, which is, of course, not going to happen. But um, the faster we make the transition, the cooler things will be, the less sea level rise we will ultimately see. So that's, that's number one. Where's the money for all of this adaptation, for elevation, for all this stuff that we're talking about going to come from? Who's going to pay for it? In the US, in, in, um, you know, we just got $31 billion in Houston for this Ike Dike. New Orleans is, needs billions. 
Norfolk needs billions. Florida needs billions. Everybody needs billions of dollars. And if there was n price was no object, you could imagine all of everybody doing really cool adaptation stuff, elevating stuff, building new coastlines, all kinds of things. But of course, money is an object. And so who's going to pay for this? Governments? I don't know. How much? Are the governments going to pay for how long? What? And, and if not them, then what? Raise taxes? Um, what are we going to do? Um, you know, entrepreneurs got to figure out some way to make money out of this. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very complicated um, economic proposition when you think about it at scale. If this was just like, oh, sea level rise is, is going to impact Port of Spain and everybody else is going to be fine, well, then, of course, you could figure out how to do that. But when you think about this hitting every coastal city in the world and every coastal community in Trinidad, how do you decide where the money goes, which leads to, well, not this one yet, um, at least the last one, just a minute, leads back to Lisa's lighthouses. Um, uh, I think the other big question is when do we stop building walls and think about living with water? I think that's really where the future is and not, um, not building seawalls. Seawalls are fine in certain places. But really, the future is adapting to water in a radically different way. And I think that's where the creativity and the brilliance of this sort of new world that we can build uh, in a world of rising seas really comes from. And then the last question <clears throat> is the most profound and most difficult and one that is the most political, which is who and what is going to be saved. Um, you can build a seawall. You can, you know, in, in New York, you can build a seawall to 52nd Street, but then it ends at 53rd Street, and the people at 53rd Street are saying, why did it not go to 53rd Street? Why not me? Much less the people who live in the Bronx or somewhere else. And the same with every community. Money is spent in, it will be spent in, in, in Port of Spain, but why not the other communities? Why not, um, you know, other towns and communities on the island? Why not? In Texas, why are we spending 31 billion in Houston? But what about New Orleans? And this question of who gets the money and who gets saved and who gets the seawalls and who doesn't is deeply, deeply, deeply political and is deeply, deeply problematic and inevitable. And um, where I think success and failure is going to be defined uh, in this, because as you all know, climate change is a, is a question of justice and equity. Uh, not everyone is being hit equally. Some people, people who can least afford to deal with it are in most cases being hit the hardest. And so how do you apportion that out? How do you think about that in, in politics? And that's the heart of the international climate change negotiations. It's questions of loss and damages, questions of the rich nations of the world causing essentially climate change and the global south, the poorer nations of the world suffering. That is the big question right now, and that reduces down onto the micro scale or smaller scale here with um, adapting to sea level rise. So, um, so those, that's, that's what I learned. That's my, um, what I learned of spending 10 years you know, going to places like this and talking to people and looking around and trying to understand um, how we're going to cope with this. And just to wrap it up, let me just say, an underscore that I really, people always ask me, you know, I've been a climate change journalist for 20 years, you know, why don't you just like go to like clinical, into clinical depression, you know, and just like, <laughs> it's so bleak, how can you do this, you know? Um, and the reason that I can do this is because I think that we're on the verge of amazing things. I think that we are going to take all of this and there's going to be huge suffering and, and cost and death. Uh, but there's also going to be amazing things, and that this is going to force a radical transformation of our world in amazing ways that we can't even begin to imagine. I've tried to imagine a few things here. But I really do think that, you know, in my travels and talking to people, I meet so many inspiring people who really are thinking differently about how we live. And it's not like, you know, the strip malls that we have and everything are like the perfect solution. A lot of them are really ugly and really dumb, and we've done a lot of dumb stuff. And here's a chance to do smarter stuff. And I really do think about it that way. And um, 
and it inspires me. So thank you. And just the last thing to, to wrap this up, I've got a new book that I have to tell you about, just briefly. It's coming out <clears throat> this summer about extreme heat, and it's a very different um, climate story. Um, you know, nobody dies from sea level rise. You don't stand on the beach and, and like, have the water come up and uh, drown you. I mean, obviously, it has implications for storm surge and stuff, but heat is really about mortality. It's about people dying um, as we get hotter and hotter, and this idea of all life on the planet is evolved in what the scientists call a Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. You know, we're all used to that. We all have, it's deep in our genes that we thrive in this narrow threshold. And not just us, but, you know, coral reefs, crops, animals, every living thing has a Goldilocks zone. And we are moving out of that Goldilocks zone. And so what does that mean? And what are the implications of that? And You'll be able to read all about that in July. And so um, thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions. Um, we're beginning to, and there's um, an inevitability to that, right? Because we are going to have to retreat and get people out of the way. But it's very, very, very complex politically because um, property rights are a very deeply held um, uh, value for many people. And if you have people who live in risky areas and say, I don't want to go, what do you do? Do you arrest them? And, you know, you can offer them, you know, a million dollars over the value of their house. Or not that that will happen, but, and so some people will still say, I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do? And so um, I think managed retreat can, is going to happen. And it's going to, there's a lot of beginning to think about that. But I don't, I have not heard of any sort of really smart, big picture thinking. I mean, it has to happen um, on a national scale, right? And I don't know the details of the UK, but like here, it, well, not here, in the US, sorry. Um, uh, you know, you can try to buy people out of their communities, but like, where are they going to go? And, you know, are they going to move just simply to higher ground nearby? Are they going to move to different states? what is the sort of national strategy for how we're going to do this? And nobody is willing to touch this because it's very politically fraught. Because telling people like that you have to leave is, you know, it's like um, deeply un-American, right? No, it is. It's like, this is my property. What are you talking about? You know, I, I'm going to stay here if I want to stay here and drown. If I want to stay here and swim, it's what's your business, you know? And so it's it's really complicated. And <clears throat> and of course you could say, well, okay, then stay there and swim, that's fine. But then don't call us when it was 9/11. You know, what do you? How are we going to deal with people who are living in, in these risky places? Are they just abandoned? Are they no longer part of the United States? I mean, how do? You, it's just very complicated. And so. It takes a lot of political courage to think about this, and there isn't much of that. Yeah, yeah, and, and <clears throat> I think a good example is FEMA actually, after a disaster, that would be the time in which people might not rebuild there, but instead yeah. they pay out so that they can rebuild in that same location, or they'll do a buyout option, but never at the value that anyone thinks that their property is, is right. worth. So, right. Yeah. Okay, uh, questions out here? I'll bring the mic. Uh, 
Thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. And um, I'm very excited to hear about your forthcoming book because during your presentation, I was thinking about those parts of the world where water isn't an issue in terms of its plentifulness, but it's increasing scarcity and, diverse, and, and desertification. And, and <laughs> one of the, you know, I guess one of the questions I always have when I hear about people moving from say the northeast of the United States or even Florida or California to a place like Texas is are you really making a choice that's sustainable because you're moving into an area where water water scarcity right. is mm -hmm. going to be a reality and it's going to be very expensive to correct um, and, you know and bringing it back to you know bringing it back to heritage um, <laughs> the lack of water and the rising temperatures introduces all kinds of challenges to preserving, you know, not only not cultural sites, but, but natural sites as well. And so there are expenses associated with that. So clearly it's a political thing, but are, you know, <laughs> sure it's American to say it's my property. It's probably not American to say, don't come here. Right. But do you, do you see evidence of that happening yet? Are people saying don't come here? Not in any formal way, but, you know, so I'm, you brought up the fact that I live in Texas, and I do, and I'm, and I'm a living example of how complicated all this is, because I lived in, um, before I lived in Austin, Texas, I lived in upstate New York, which was like the, if you could pick one of the places in the United States, that, like the most climate resilient, best places to live. I lived in a historic town, Saratoga Springs, very incredibly beautiful architecture lovely place, lived in a Victorian house. Um, I lived, it, there's water, there's timber, there's p food. I mean, it's just like, it's like if you're gonna want to weather climate future, that's where you'd be. I left and moved to Austin, which is like, has all kinds of problems, extreme heat, water, all those kinds of things. But I did it because I fell in love with someone who lived in Austin <laughs> and she couldn't move. And so I was like, I'd rather live with her in Austin, you know, than by myself, you know, in Saratoga. I would live with her in a, like, as I wrote in the book, in a tent in the Sahara, right? I mean, it's like, so you, you make these decisions in complicated ways. And, and that's why this whole question of where are we going to move, where are we going to retreat, how are we going to do this, are so fraught with personal things. And, I mean, Texas is a great example of are there going to be limits, right? I mean, Texas is in big trouble for lots of reasons. Water being one of them. I wrote about the Rio Grande drying up. and um, But, you know, no developer, certainly in Texas, is ever going to say, don't come here. And people are just going to continue coming, and they're going to, the people who, who are richer and can buy water and deal with it will do okay, and the people who can't won't. And, you know, I, I, I don't see breaking, you know, putting a break on, on development in the U.S. happening. I mean, I just, you mentioned the storms, you know, hurricane rebuilding. You know, what we're seeing there is, re is gentrification, right? All the poorer people can't afford to rebuild. They don't get their insurance for their houses. So rich people come in, and they spend a lot of money, build houses they think are resilient. They don't really care if it costs another couple hundred grand. <clears throat> they just want to live on the water. And they want to live on the water if it's 10 years, 15 years, whatever. That's fine. You know, they don't... And so we're seeing more building on the coast, even though you could say it's more resilient, but it's also pushing out all of the people who you know, have lived there for generations and are plumbers or something who aren't you know, venture capitalists or private equity people you know, who have money to burn. Um, so all this stuff is just really complicated. And without you know, strong national leadership on this, you know, I don't know how it gets dealt with on a local level. I think it, there needs to be, we're really lacking when you think about adaptation and how we're going to shape our future in the climate, you know, in a, in a, in a fast changing world. There's no thinking about this, really. It, it's just, we're thinking about clean energy technology and subsidizing and building clean energy technology, which is really important. And we're thinking about kind of water issues and stuff. But I mean, look at the water, I'm sorry, go on and on about this, but the water in the West, right? And the, the problems with the Colorado River and, and um, California, we were talking about that earlier. I mean, these water rights struggles are incredibly difficult to deal with. And 
the politics of it are, are brutal. Yeah. Good thing. Yeah. Um, what I also wanted to point out too, though, was a lot of the secondary effects of the sea level rise. One of them that here in the Caribbean that we're feeling very hard the last years is the sargassum, and the fact sargassum is now coming yeah. in and inundating everywhere. And yeah. It is a health hazard. It's a serious issue, and it's all tied to these uh, changing currents, ocean yep. currents, and such. But another one is toxic algae. As these areas, particularly relatively shallow areas, are getting inundated, toxic algae are going to be a big killer, and they do it does kill people. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're going to have a lot of still stagnant water coming in, that's going to be a very serious issue to deal with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there's a, sm a small final point, and this is on the hope side again, is that Hopefully, with the younger generations, we're now going to be able to look at ways to, yes, there's going to be a lot of inundated structures, whole inundated cities. We need to look at ways to reuse inundated buildings, reuse inundated facilities. I mean, fish farming or whatever, so, yeah. but ways of, of taking the ruins that are caused by the sea level change and then rebuild them into repurposing them and, and dealing other ways. Yeah, I think repurposing and reusing things is going to be hugely important. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I think we appreciate there's no single solution to this problem, but in your opinion, based on your travels and your experience, which would you favor, mitigation or adaptation? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think you can separate them. I mean, you, you, you know, without mitigation, adaptation just becomes more and more difficult, and you know, you can't think seriously about adaptation without mitigation. But if you think only about mitigation, then you're ignoring the reality of what's happening in our world. And one of the things that the most you know, some interesting things have happened in the sort of climate mitigation adaptation science in, in the last couple of years. And one is that because of progress with cleaner energy and stuff, the sort of worst case for sea levels of warming, the apocalyptic, oh my God, you know, the whole world's in flames scenarios that were people were thinking were possible. Scientists, and I say people. Yeah. Um, that's how narrow my brain is. <laughs> There's scientists and people. Um, uh, you know, because of the progress we've made, we've taken the, the, the 4C warming off the table. They don't, no one thinks that's really going to happen anymore. But now, you know, 3C is sort of a worst case scenario, which is still a lot. But it's better, the apocalyptic scenarios are much better because we've done a good job of mitigating. We're starting to really do it, you know? I mean, you go to many places in the world and you start to really see it. And virtually everywhere in the world now, clean energy is cheaper than fossil fuel energy. And it's just a matter of time before we really get more serious. But the, pro the flip side of that is that we've also seen that climate impacts are bigger at lower levels. So we're just beginning to under, like the Antarctica thing is a perfect example. No one worried about that before. And we're seeing already the 4-2C of warming that Antarctica is destabilized. We're seeing that with crop failures. We're seeing that with droughts. We're seeing that with these atmospheric rivers that are wiping out, or not wiping out, but are hugely impacting California right now. So I think climate mitigation and adaptation are inseparable. And you have to have intelligent discussion about them both. And you have to go pedal to the metal on them both, because that's our world now. Thank you very much for your scholarship, especially your investment for the broad scope of what's happening, both in the short term and the long term. I just want to comment and a future question. Yeah. Um, I'm talking in the context of the urban and regional planner and an environmental and heritage specialist, where hearing from you, you take, back, you take back from your presentation, it's three things I'm hearing. Political will at the end of the day, societal and scientific. 
Second is money. We really have to face our economic decision making. And thirdly, it's the engineering solution. Yeah? Right. Stay or go. And in the context of Car the Caribbean, we are at the forefront of climate change impacts right now. And the biggest one, of course, is our hurricanes and the whole heating of the oceans and the rising conditions. And from a planning perspective, I'm very much concerned as a Caribbean planner that we have to look at urban planning design and getting our cities or coastal environments work out. And that's going to be both the money side, the political world side is a big question. So coming to your question, where you're seeing in the world, society is actually making the political will to move or change, especially small islands. We saw the Malvel case example. And I recently was in going through ch um, China down the Yangtze River. And you, it's amazing just dealing with their dam change, how their heritage sites, they basically took it and moved it. And that cost a lot of money. And talking about money in China, China is now the big investor in the Caribbean, where yeah. we don't have World Bank mm -hmm. and so forth. We're looking mm -hmm. at engineering solutions. So where you're seeing where the money is coming from, the political coming from, and the engineering solution, are you seeing any case example where people are moving forward rapidly? in the short term or any big proposals apart from the big money projects in, in Texas, thanks. Small island context. Yeah, I, unfortunately, um, you probably have a better idea of that uh, as far as the sort of small islands that are doing the most right now because um, I haven't been like traveling there or really uh, I've been absorbed in the heat book um, for a, a little bit and I, I haven't really looked at the sort of latest projects on, in small island nations. I mean, obviously, they're hugely politically powerful, right? I mean, the whole 1.5 target in the Paris Agreement happened because of, the, because of the small island states cutting together and saying, no, you know, we need to get serious about this. But as far as and so I'm aware, I, I know a lot about what they're doing politically on the mitigation side, but what they're doing on the adaptation side and where the money is coming from. And China's a really interesting case that you brought up. And, you know, I just spent, um, you know, several weeks uh, in Africa, and you see the Chinese influence very, very powerfully there um, with their Belt and Road projects and things like that. You know, my instinct is that the Chinese are not known for um, the projects that I've seen. They're, they're not known for their innovative uh, design and, and strategies. They're, they're, the stuff that I've seen, especially in Africa, is very much sort of big, heavy infrastructure, concrete roads, kind of not what I would call progressive 21st century thinking, but, you know, um, familiar 20th century thinking. Um, but there may be things that are going on that I'm just not aware of. But, yeah. Interesting that the small islands, small countries, seem to be able to move things up more rapidly. Right. In theory, yeah. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Right, and I also think, yeah, exactly, people who will be here will have much better ideas. But I also think that the political advantage of that, right, of a, a small island saying, look, we are the... Um, you know, we're, we are the model. Look what we've done. And, you know, I think that just from a political point of view, that's huge, right? I mean, that's really important. Yeah. David. Great job, Jeff. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, one comment, two very quick anecdotes, and I promise a question <laughs> at, at the end of all of that. Uh, I pre-ordered uh, your book and bought your current book. Uh, which means I wasn't paying floor. attention for a couple minutes. <laughs> um, good, good. I, that's what I was trying to warm you up. Ironically, while you were dealing with Sandy, right at that moment, I was in Havana at the uh, convention center watching a documentary about how the Cuban government had moved the coastal population in a particular area along the northern coast into apartment buildings against their will, you know, yeah. just, but that's the beauty of a uh, dictatorship, I suppose. No pesky public meetings. Uh, and each of them got a uh, new rice cooker uh, <laughs> as well. Um, Problem solved. So anecdote number one. Anecdote number two, um, 
if you remember Bob Sheets, he used to be the guy on TV, was at the National Hurricane Center in Miami every time that there was a hurricane in the United States. Uh, when I was based in Naples, we invited him over to give a, ge a guest speech. And in those days, the satellite data wasn't so good. So they took a helicopter and flew the entire coast of Florida taking still images. That was the before. Then a hurricane would hit. They do the same thing to get the after. And then they flew it again to get the after the after. And those homes were rebuilt in exactly the same spots. You, you mentioned this before. And it was striking uh, to the audience and very effective um, in, in making us realize this is stupid. Um, and uh, in many ways, and you also touched on this, enabled by the insurance right. companies. So I'm wondering if you could just expand a little bit on that lever of uh, in the cost of insurance or the lack thereof uh, entirely as insurance companies rethink all of this. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting and complicated um, uh, question, but I just want to say first, you know, you, as far as people being relocated in Havana and things, this relocation thing is really a problem for democracy, right? So like Jakarta, they're talking about moving the entire capital, right, um, to higher ground, and they're just going to do it. And, you know, it's not a problem if you're an autocrat, if you just, I'm sure Vladimir Putin will have no problem, you know, dealing with St. Petersburg. Um, uh, but it's a problem if you wanted to get elected and if you want to make people happy and you want people to support you. So it's, it's a really a problem of democracy. Um, and the insurance thing, and that's, you know, the whole thing of rebuilding after the storms and, you know, I, I, I mean, I feel this person is like, didn't anybody read my book? I mean, you know, <laughs> no, but I, I mean, Miami, for example, South Florida is just like such a textbook case of, you know, this is really dumb what you're doing and rebuilding and rebuilding. And there's no incentives in the insurance industry to move somewhere else. There's, there's, you know, there's incentives for, you know, there's better building codes and things like that, right? So that you have to rebuild in a stronger way. But it just means that, like I said earlier, more richer people are, are, are building things there. And, and so, you know, there's no, uh, because as I was mentioning, it's not just about like the houses, it's also about the roads and the, you know, the septic systems and all those kinds of things. And there's no sense of like, we need to do this differently, we need to move this stuff. There's no, you know, DeSantis is not going to say, oh, sorry, we're gonna like slow down on the rebuilding here in Miami for a while, right? It's no way, it's all these cryptocurrency dudes and everything who don't care about they lose a hundred grand or whatever, it costs a hundred grand more. I mean, it's this, you know, what Naomi Klein called disaster capitalism, right? And, you know, the insurance companies are not gonna lead on that, you know? As long as, you know, because the people who, who have the wealthiest houses and who are doing the most rebuilding, they don't really care about insurance, right? They don't, they're not really worried about it. It's the people who spend their, work their entire lives, who buy a house for $200,000, rebuild the bathroom themselves, all that kind of thing. And then, you know, they're, in Florida, the insurance companies are just saying, we're not writing insurance anymore. You know, so they're stuck with, like, either paying exorbitant rates for these sort of weird fly-by-night insurance companies or have not having insurance, but then the, you can't get a mortgage and there, it's, a, it's a, 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 a real problem that is not getting solved, you know? Or it is getting solved, but it's getting solved in a, in a different way, which is we're gonna build more rich people down there because who cares? And they already, they already are, and now there's a, you know, there's a state of Florida has a insurance, a state kind of insurance of last resort kind of thing, but that's going bankrupt too, or deeply in debt because of all this. So the hamster wheel will eventually stop, but for a, it's been going very fast for a long time. And some people argue, and this goes to development and stuff, 
that this is the way we're going to solve this, is by like building more and more, faster and faster, better and better, that we have to accelerate building along the coast rather than retreat or pull away, right? The, 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 the engine of um, success in coastal redevelopment is to knock a lot of junk down, give developers full reign to build what they, you know, stuff that's more sustainable, and keep the economic engine going. And every 20 years, you're reinventing the coast and rebuilding it more, and, and that there's this accelerated development is the answer, not restricted development, which is basically what Miami and what South Florida is doing. And we'll see how that works out. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Um, nice, innovative um, ideas. But concerning historic restoration to the Caribbean itself, basically we own a lot of historic buildings. Now climate controls affect us because one, we have where we have some of the churches moving, some of the structures and the finials now are affected basically by the amount of water that is on the building now that wasn't there before. How do we mitigate that? How do we um, root some of that problem and how do we solve some of that problem basically based on what is the first step, second step, and the long-term effect of what we can cause? I'm sorry, so you're asking me how, how to, how to how deal with we, that? Yeah, how do we deal with, um, you say, keeping it afloat? Our problem is yeah. trying to stay afloat and fixing some of the old problem that didn't used to occur before. The amount of rainfall that we get now yeah. is triple the amount of would normally come down in a, let's say, a two-inch pipe compared to a six-inch pipe. Right. So we have now to look to adjust what was there before and keeping historically the look without changing the footprint and without changing the building structure. Well, you know, you have, this is what everything, I think, the next three days is going to be about. Um, <laughs> So I get, to total, I get to totally dodge this and <laughs> say that's a brilliant question, and we're going to think about it for three days, and we're going to talk about it for three days. Um, but no, that's, but that's the, that is the thing, right? I mean, how, how do you keep this historical stuff viable? And, you know, I mean, it's, it's why this conference is so important. And um, I think that there will be a lot of ideas and conversation about that in, in the next few days. And um, I'm just here to set the table. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeff, very yeah. much. We appreciate it. Um, and yeah, to that question, we will get to that. You'll hear from a couple of people. But one note I will make, building codes can be useful when you're re building for greater resilience. However, building codes keep you from doing the vernacular type of building that we had seen uh, with your, your project in Nigeria. And I think that is the challenge we face, particularly in the US, is that we are so constrained by building codes that the flexibility isn't there to do things that are innovative. And so I'm not sure how we deal with that, but we are going to have to deal with it down the road. So. Um, we are going to be picking up uh, the shuttles. Do you want to go ahead and tell us where? And I will just make a point. I know we're a smaller group here, but you need to be registered if you haven't registered yet. Uh, it's open at 7.30 tomorrow morning, uh, and then we will be starting here at 8.30 in the morning. So uh, I will turn it over to Karen. She'll tell you where, where we're going. I think everybody knows we're going to our office. Yes, I really am excited for you guys to see it. I know lots of even locals haven't been there. and They're like, what's the National Trust? So this is great. Uh, so everyone who wanted a shuttle would have signed up. I think there's just enough for one. We actually had two. So um, he's already here. So if you can make your way down to the lobby, Crystal in the back in the lovely striped dress, uh, well, you can just follow her. And we can all go have a good time at the Cofields now. Thank you all. One of the order forms for Jeff's book, I'm always pitching the books. So <laughs> pick up an order form for it. Or be like David and just order it online right now. So
Friday through the ninth. Oh yeah, okay. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you.